Okay, so let's make our first part. So we're in the part module, and the first uh, thing we have on the left at the top says create a part. So I'm going to click on that, and you're going to get asked some questions. First of all, uh, name. Uh, part-1 is fine for now. We can change that if we want. And the modeling space is kind of important. If we're going to make a three-dimensional model, like a solid object, then we'll use a 3D modeling space. If we want to do something like a flat plate with a hole, then we'll do a 2D planar. Or we can choose an axisymmetric part, where we just define part of the plane of the model, and then we can spin that around to create a 3D uh, object. So uh, the other type is deformable, discrete rigid, analytical rigid, and Eulerian. Right now we're going to do deformable. We'll talk about those other options later. Uh, and then the base feature is going to be a solid, a shell, wire, or point. And so let's do a 3D modeling space. We're going to use a uh, solid object with a revolution. And the approximate size is kind of important for for everything to show up on a grid properly. As we'll talk about, finite elements are is set up as a unitless type of quantity. Uh, 200 might represent 200 feet, 200 miles, 200 millimeters, 200 microns. Uh, let's set this up as uh, we use the default 200 and we're going to have in the back of our mind that we're going to use millimeters. So let's uh, hit continue on this. And here we have our grid. Now this this green line is our line that we're going to revolve our plane about. And so we have all these features that we can use, create an isolated point, connect the points, we can make circles, we can make arcs, we can do all kinds of things. And I'll let you explore some of these and we'll use some of these later. Uh, here is an undo last action that's important sometimes. Here's a redo last action. And this uh, will allow us to add a sketch or to save a sketch. So we can take maybe an AutoCAD file and bring the AutoCAD file into Abacus and work with it that way. We're going to do something very simple. We're going to make a cylinder and we're going to just put it in uniaxial tension. So let's start by creating a couple points. Uh, let's make 0, 0, our initial point. You see that it shows up as this pink spot right here. And maybe our radius of our specimen is 10 millimeters. So I'm going to go 10, 0. And then maybe it's 50 millimeters tall. So I'm going to go 0, 50, create another point. Now you noticed that point didn't show up. It's above here somewhere. What I'm going to do is I'm going to refit the view by clicking this button. And there it is. Now I can also go to this magnifying glass and I can have the magnifying glass and I can shrink the view or I can expand the view as I'd like. And then we're going to make one more point, 10, 50. So now we have four points. We're going to put lines around that. I'm going to start here and you notice I'm going in a particular direction around here and it's created those lines. Okay, so it says sketch the section for the revolved solid. So if all we want is a cylinder, this is a plane of the cylinder, if we revolve it along that, around that green line we're going to get our component. So that's good enough for us for right now. Again, this is mainly about using some of these options in here and not necessarily trying to do a sophisticated stress analysis. So then uh, when we're ready we're going to hit done. Now it's going to ask us for the angle of revolution. You can do this as a partial revolution. Maybe you can apply some boundary conditions to uh, for symmetry. But for, for us right now let's go ahead and do a full 360 degree revolution. And uh, we're going to hit OK. So now we have our cylinder. If I go to this arrow, the rotate view arrow, I can go over here and run. Uh, you may not see this. I am left clicking and I am rotating this around. So we can take a look at our shape. So now we have a component 
or a part that's been built in Abacus. Now it's usually a good idea to save your files frequently. It always saves them in your temp folder that you set up when you install the software. And I kind of like to go sequentially, so I'm going to call this CYL for cylinder dash one, and I'll increment that number as I do more saves. If for some reason I have to go back a version, then I know uh, I can find it. I'm just going to save it as a CAE model database. That's fine. So we're done with our part. We can do fancier things. We can remove pieces, make holes through it, and, and whatnot. But for us, right now, uh, that's fine. We're going to go down here to Properties. So let's click on our Create Material. Let's say we want to make this out of steel. You put in a description if you would like. Uh, you have to hit the pencil. Basic steel, elastic only behavior. And we can go to mechanical. You see there's lots of options. Elasticity, plasticity, damage, uh, brittle cracking, and all kinds of interesting things. Let's look at general. We can specify a density for the material, um, user-defined materials, and so forth. We can specify thermal properties, conductivity, and electromagnetic properties, and all kinds of interesting things. For us right now, let's do, do a basic linear elastic analysis. So we're going to go over here to elastic. Okay. Type isotropic. We can do anisotropic, orthotropic, and all these different things. These are all described in the user manual. And uh, we'll look at that maybe a little bit later. There are some sub options. We can specify failure stress, a failure strain, and whatnot. And we can also specify temperature dependent data. You may know that as you heat up a material, its properties may change. Even the elastic modulus may change a little bit as you change the temperature. And you can define that by specifying your modulus of elasticity and Poisson's ratio at various numbers of temperatures. Now, this number of field variables uh, allows you to have other information along with your Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio at those different temperatures or at the same temperature and those might be used by maybe a user material model or, or something else. So this is fine for us right now. Now if we want to do steel it's 210 gigapascals. I mentioned we're going to use the millimeter unit system and this is something that we'll emphasize in the class is that if we're going to use newtons and millimeters our stresses then are going to be that force unit divided by that length unit squared, which means the stresses that get output will be a newton per square millimeter, which is a megapascal. That also means our input properties need to be in units of megapascals. So 210 gigapascals for steel is going to be 210,000 megapascals. Again, we'll talk more in detail about that later. Poisson's ratio, we're just going to put down 0.3 for that. And we're going to hit OK. Right, let's see what we have here. We're going to create a section. You're going to need a section for anything that can deform. Section 1 is fine. Here's a solid. If we had beams, we'd select beams and so forth. And, and you may think that we have a beam, but we're modeling this as three-dimensional solid elements. A beam is a one-dimensional type element where we need to specify its axes, like for an I-beam, the bending axis, whether it's horizontal or vertical or, or what have you for that cross section. Uh, for us, we're going to do a homogeneous solid section called section one. We'll continue. And it pops up with our first material, which is steel. If we wanted it out of something else, we would apply this drop down. If we wanted to create a new material, we'd go over here and create a new material. We do not have plane stress or plane strain conditions in this case, so we're not going to check that box but we're going to hit OK. So now we've created a section, and as you see, things are starting to populate over here. Okay. The next thing we want to do then is we want to assign a section. Okay. 
So select the regions to be assigned a section. And it's going to call that set one. We can change that if we want. For now, the default is, is fine. Okay, so I'm hovering over this and I'm going to left click to select it. And you see it's changed color. These lines are now orange. And I'm going to hit done. Okay, the list contains only sections that are applicable to the selected region. So if we mean it made a beam section, it would not be applicable to our three dimensional section that we have here. If we want to create a section, then we do that here. So everything looks OK, so I'm going to hit OK. And now you notice it's changed color. Once we've assigned that section, now it is this, this greenish color. There are other options that we have over here. If we had a composite layup, uh, we could do that. Uh, if we want to define particular directions or material orientations for anisotropic materials, we could do that here as well. Now each of these menus that you see out here, these are the, the man managers. So if I clicked on Material Manager, it pops up this where I can delete this material, I can rename it, I can edit the properties, and so forth. We can get to that also over here in the model tree by left clicking to expand this, clicking on that, and then right clicking so that we can edit that material property or delete it or what have you. So now we're done with the property menu. Let's see what's next. We have an assembly and we've created a part but we need to instance it into our assembly. Now I have that nice looking cylinder. I could have that same geometry in my assembly 50 times if I want. And if I make a change to my part it will automatically update every instance in that assembly. So this is uh, something that took me a little while to catch on to because I shifted from using uh, kind of this non-CAD environment to uh, this GUI. But it's fairly useful. You can have these patterns like an array. You can have a circular pattern or a radial pattern and do all kinds of interesting things. For us right now, to keep it simple, we're just going to make one copy of that cylinder and so we're going to go to this where it says create an instance. Create an instance from parts or from models. You can import finite element meshes from other programs and we'll do that later. And in that case you probably want to create an instance from a model. If you have made a bunch of parts using the sketcher built into Abacus CAE then you probably have your parts named part one, two, three, or maybe something more descriptive. So we're going to do this from a part. That's fine. You see it kind of showed up right here. And here's the instance type. This can also be a little bit confusing. But this is a dependent instance where we mesh on the part. So if I instance this part and it's a dependent instance type, if I change my mesh, it will automatically update that mesh in the assembly or when I regenerate it. If it's independent, then it will mesh on the particular instance. So I can change the instance. Maybe I want to make one rod skinnier than the other or taller than the other or whatnot. I can do that from the base geometry of my part, but edit that on the particular instance. We're going to use the default. We're going to use dependent. You can also have an auto offset from other instances. It's not important in this case. All right, so now we have a part in our assembly. We can do other things. We can change our assembly and edit some features and so forth. For now, this is fine. The next thing we'll go to is our step. And we have an initial step. and we can create a new step. In our initial step we may have some initial boundary conditions and we will create those. But let's create a step and uh, we're going to call it step one. It's going to be inserted after the initial step and here's the procedure type. Procedure type is general. You can also do linear perturbation if you want to do buckling analysis or something like that. And here are the different types of analyses we can do. It's fairly extensive. We can do temperature and displacement that are coupled. We can do direct cyclic analyses, dynamic implicit, dynamic explicit, all this kind of good stuff. 
We're going to keep it simple. We're going to do a static general. As we go through the course, we'll learn more about these other procedure types. Hit continue. And uh, here's a basic description. So we can type something in here or we can leave it blank. And I'm just going to type in load the cylinder. Now there's some options on here that are kind of important to understand what they do. It's very tempting to just hit the default. But um, let's talk about some of these. The time period is 1. Now what does 1 represent? Well, if you're in the Newton millimeter second unit system, that time represents one second. Is one second any different than one hour? Well, it depends on what type of analysis you're going to do and what kind of material properties you have. If you have viscoelastic or visco viscoplastic material properties such that it's very time dependent, whether you represent that and meaning that to be one second or one hour is a big difference. For a linear elastic, find an element analysis where we just put in the modulus elasticity and Poisson's ratio, doesn't really matter. Time period is one. We'll leave it at that. Nonlinear geometry, we have it off. If you have something that deforms substantially when it's loaded, think of a uh, maybe a balloon or something where that is really expanding a lot, or maybe a cantilever beam that deforms a whole lot. We may want to turn this nonlinear geometry on. Automatic stabilization, we'll just have none. Uh, that would be for more sophisticated analyses. Um, so we'll just leave these as defaults. Now, over on this other tab, the incrementation, this can be kind of important. We have the type as automatic, and we can change it to fixed. And here, the maximum number of increments is 100. That means. Um, it will stop your, your analysis will stop if it cannot converge within 100 increments. Maybe we want more increments than this. This is where you change that. So suppose we change this to 1000 seconds and we had in the, our, our, our head that we wanted to output our analysis results for every single second. We would have 1000 outputs. But our maximum number of increments was 100, we wouldn't get to 1,000. So we have to be a little bit conscious about our time and our maximum number of increments, how those work together. Right now, the default is fine. When this gets to be a problem is when you have things that take a lot of small increments, like uh, contact and um, dynamic events and things like that. Our initial increment size can be 1. That's fine. Our minimum increment is uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 5. Our maximum increment size is 1. That's, that's okay too. Um, later on in our other analyses, we want to change these values. We go to other. We don't usually have to mess with much of this, but we have these options where we can have a symmetric or unsymmetric matrix storage. Um, we can use a direct or iterative solver and different types of solution techniques. Typically, you won't change any of these, but these are options that you should be aware of that uh, are available in here. So let's go back to basic, and we're going to hit OK. So we have to remember our time period is 1. We'll go back and change that in a little bit. All right, so now we created a step. We're going to create a field output. Now fields are things like stress fields, strain fields, things that vary spatially. They may also vary with time, but they might vary spatially. So we're going to have it in step one, and we're going to go continue. And we can select stresses, you know, the von Mises stress, or coordinate stresses, and so forth. Or uh, we can output at pre-selected defaults, and it has these things. And all these different codes mean something in particular. Logarithmic strain, plastic strain, and so forth. S is for stresses used for displacements and, and whatnot. For our purposes right now, predicted pre-selected defaults is fine. Now, it's for the whole model, and the frequency is every n increments. And we have n set equal to 1. And the timing is output at exact times. This is okay for now. We're going to change it uh, in a little bit. 
So now we go down here to the next one, create a history output. We can do that as well. History output are things that change with time, but don't necessarily change spatially. They might be like energy of the system. The energy may, kinetic energy or something may change with time. And we'll hit continue. And the same sort of thing. We can choose the pre-selected defaults, or we can go in here and specify contact stresses and uh, very particular things. Every any increments, I'll put it exact times is fine. So we're going to hit OK. Uh, we can partition edges and so forth, but I, I think uh, we're, we're fine here. Next is interaction. This would be things like if I had the cylinder and I wanted to drop it on the floor, we can tell where the floor was and the interaction between the floor and the cylinder. For our purposes, we're not going to use this one in this example. Now we're going to go down to loads. Okay, so this says create a load. And it's going to create it in step one. It's going to be mechanical. Let's do a pressure load. We have these different choices. And then we're going to hit continue. Select the surfaces for the load individually. You see how it highlighted that? It's highlighting that now. Or we can specify by angle. So now it's highlighted that top circle. Let's do by angle. Now you can change this angle. Um, that can, if you're, if you get a lot of curved surfaces, it can kind of help you zone in on the right surface we want to select. Usually this 20 degree angle is fine. And so uh, we'll highlight that. And now you see it's changed color. We're going to create a surface it's called surface one. We can change the name if we want and say that's going to be our load surface. Now here's the distribution. It can be uniform, or you can specify it by creating a field on the surface of that. Here's the magnitude. Now if I put a value of, um, say, uh, 100, okay, that's going to be a pressure. The units of that pressure are going to be in megapascals. That pressure pushes down on the surface. Maybe I want my pressure to be in tension, though. So I'm going to put in minus 100. And the amplitude, the default is ramp. You can specify your amplitude and you can have something that ramps uh, maybe quadratically or parabolically or, or whatever. You can specify this very precisely by specifying the an amplitude curve. For right now a ramp is fine. What that means is it changes linearly with time. Over our one second we should ramp from 0 to minus 100 pressure and a negative pressure means that we're pulling this thing out in tension. We're going to create boundary conditions. And here the step is step one. Let's put our boundary conditions in the initial step. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I want to put it on the bottom surface. I'm going to fix the bottom. So I'm going to rotate this around so I can get a good view of that. And when I'm done rotating, then I click the X and I get back to my previous panel. So I can have symmetry, anti-symmetry, and cast. That means like a fixed end. I can specify displacement. And there are different things, connector velocities and whatnot. We're going to select displacement. We're going to create a set. We're going to highlight the bottom. We'll call that set set 1. That's fine. And now it allows us to specify what we want to fix, what kind of displacements we want to have for our initial boundary conditions. Let's say we want it completely fixed. U1, 2, and 3 are displacements. And UR1, UR2, UR3 are rotations. Now, we shouldn't expect to see any rotations. We'll see if we need to come back and change this. But uh, I don't think we should. Now, we can also select different coordinate systems. We can have a local coordinate system. Maybe we want only the radial displacement to be fixed or we want the radial displacement to be free and the theta displacement to be fixed. Well, we can set up a local coordinate system and do that here. It says, note the displacement value will be maintained in subsequent steps. So any other step we take, once we set this boundary condition in the initial step, those will remain until we remove them 
through some other step. Okay, so now we have that bottom fixed. We've got a load on the top. And there's some other options in here. Again, those are something that, that we'll maybe take a look at for, for later cases. So now we're done with our load module. Let's go to our mesh. We still haven't meshed this thing yet. And that's kind of the philosophy that they have. You create your part and you try to apply your your loads and your boundary conditions to the part so that if you have to remesh your part, all those loads and boundary conditions get reapplied to those new elements that you create. This is a little bit different than what you might be used to if you're uh, an old timer like me using some kind of finite element code where you apply your nodes, your boundary conditions and your loads to your nodes of your finite element mesh. Okay, so we have this part here. The first thing, and you see how this works, it kind of starts at the top and goes down. Uh, first thing we want to do is we want to seed our part instance. Okay, and uh, you see this a lot. Dependent part instances cannot be edited or assigned mesh attributes. Try the operation on the associated part or make independent from the model tree. So we're going to go over here. We're going to go to part. Here's my part one. Now we're going to apply this to the part. And this window will pop up and let us do that. Now, here's the approximate global size. Now, if you remember, when we made our radius, we said it was about 10 units. If I have my approximate mesh size to be 5 units, it's going to be a fairly coarse mesh. Maybe we want something finer than that. Let's try 2. Now, curvature control is fine. Um, minimum size control, you can set those if the, you don't like the mesh. And we're going to hit Apply. And now we have seeded the mesh instance. Okay, so we have all those little dots that showed up there for a second. Hopefully they're still there. And what we're going to do then is we're going to uh, mesh this part. It says OK to mesh the part. We come down here and confirm. I'm going to left click and go yes. And there is our meshed part. I'm going to rotate this around. And we can take a look at the quality of the mesh. Personally, I find auto meshers to be somewhat lacking. They are extremely convenient, but you lose some ability to uh, really get a nice mesh. You see this element right here in the middle? That is, a, in my opinion, not a very good form for a three-dimensional element. Just the angles are, are not good. Now you can go back there and you can specify minimums for those angles make things look a little bit better. We can also go back and reseed the mesh and we can change the element size. Now something that you may or may not know about finite elements at this point is that the more elements you have in your mesh the longer the solution time will take. Let's just go with this and we'll see if we have any weird looking stresses. Okay, so now we have this mesh and uh, we're going to get out of the rotation menu and uh, we're done. So let's see what we have left. We can specify some optimization procedure. Uh, this is a little bit beyond our scope. We can create an optimization task and you know we can put um, we can say the stresses need to be so high we can make a constraint so that we can make this into a tube and it should find the thickness of the tube that will hold the stresses that we specify. So it's a very neat optimization procedure. It's just a little bit beyond what we want to do at this point. And uh, now we'll go to the job menu. Now you can always also access that down here. So let's look at the first one, create a job. And we're going to always default as job one. Uh, now if you do a whole lot of jobs and you're practicing, you know, like job one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Uh, I think that you should do something a little bit more descriptive. Maybe cylinder dash one. The source is going to be the model. Okay. And we'll hit continue. And um, here you can put it in a description. Here's a full analysis or a restart. You have to set up the restart in order to do a restart. So we're going to choose the full analysis. We're going to submit time immediately. That doesn't mean uh, it's going to hit. It's going to be submitted when we hit OK, though. And that's kind of a weird thing. 
but we'll see uh, how to submit the job. And over here in general, you can output the in echo the input data if you want to take a look at it. Uh, you can specify user subroutines and whatnot. Memory, so this says maximum preprocessor and analysis memory, 90% of what your computer has. And parallelization, if you want to use multiple processors, you can select this and you can put this up to the number of processors that you have. Uh, my particular computer I'm working on right now has 32 processors, so I can process that. If we set this to 32 processors, though, it will take additional analysis tokens. Let's just go ahead and use two processors. And here's the precision. We can use single precision or full precision for our computer, just like double precision if you're familiar with Fortran. So it shouldn't really matter. Let's just go ahead and go full, but you can do single, and it should be fine. Now we'll hit OK. Now this job has not been submitted, it's just been created. So I'm going to go here into the model tree under analysis. I'm going to right click on cylinder and we're going to go and hit submit. And fingers crossed, we'll see what happens. So it says uh, we made 2800 elements. The job has been submitted for analysis. If we want to see what's going on, we can right click on this and select monitor. And it says the job has been completed successfully. So we can take a look at the results and dismiss this. We can load in the results through the results file, but this is pretty handy. If you go here on this job and click right click, you can just select results and it will switch us over to the results tab. And now we see our mesh. Now let's see what happens. This is the contour on the deformed shape. So that's kind of interesting. We have all of this in orange, but we have some blue in here, and these are the stresses. So we applied 100 megapascals of stress, and this is our legend. Now our legend is kind of small. Uh, let's see if we can size that up so you can see it. Uh, let's see if I can find the right one. Here's common plot options. Let's take a look at it. Here's our scale factor. The deformation scale factor is by 212. Sometimes you want to make that one, so you'd make a uniform one, or you can do it non-uniform. Here's all edges, feature edges, and so forth. If we do that and hit apply, then we'll just see the cylinder like that. Uh, let's see. Normals, other. And some of this, I have to go back and, and figure out where I need to look for these. Uh, let's look for contour options. We can specify limits on our contour. Right now, it's saying we're in between 59.99 and 106. Maybe we want the minimum to be zero. So we can do that. You notice our contour has changed just a little bit. So there's lots of different options in here. We can select this button and animate it. That's going extremely fast. So I'm going to click on the the manager down below, and I'm going to slide this over and uh, hit apply. And it will go much slower. Okay, move it around. We're taking a look. And you see it's a different color, a different stress here. But remember, we, we fixed all of the deformation on the entire bottom surface so none of it can move on that bottom plane. In fact we've over constrained this a little bit so in that over constraint situation we have some different stresses than 100 megapascals that we might otherwise expect. The bulk of this should be about 100 megapascals. Now if we want we can probe uh, the values and find out the exact value but this will give you uh, the basic idea now of setting up uh, an analysis using the Abacus model tree procedure. Uh, so what I would suggest is you go through and repeat this process just to start learning these different panels and, and play around. There's different things you can do. You see this one? It says uh, we can do a view cut. We activate it. Now we've sliced away part of that model. We can rotate it and we can look inside.
if you want this to stop animating you come over here and you can walk through the animation this way now we only have two steps in our, our two increments in our step the initial and the final we can go back and change this and we can put in a lot of steps so we can have a lot of different uh, we have more a smoother animation if we would like uh, but here we have that here all right so go back and try to repeat this process and and I would also suggest take the opportunity to maybe make a more sophisticated type of shape, maybe something with a notch in it or, or something, and uh, revolve it again. See what you get. You will get errors. You will have some warnings. Um, so if you get those at this point, kind of, kind of back off and, and uh, restart it. But eventually we will learn how to do all these different things and analyze the warning errors and messages. We're going to do some very sophisticated analyses, we'll look at impact of deformable objects against uh, rigid walls, we'll look at deformable objects hitting deformable objects, uh, and, and all kinds of interesting things, heat transfer, rigid body analysis, um, dynamics, natural frequencies, we'll look at elastic plastic, we'll look at scripting and abacus, and, uh, and hopefully even if you're already an expert or very good at Abacus, hopefully you'll pick up a few tips as we go along.